And probably one of the most important trends in payments is the talk around the central bank digital currencies, better known as uh, among all of us as the CBDCs. Uh, joining our moderator, Kevin Bate from Delta Strategy Group, are Daniel from Gattaca and Chris Giancarlo, from, who is a former CTFC chairman in the US, now part of uh, Wilke and Farr and Gallica, uh, to discuss about the digital dollar project and many more. I would also like to take uh, this special moment and give a very very big shout out to Dan Spuller, a good friend of ours at the Two Unitize, who is the co-chair of the North Carolina Blockchain Initiative for helping us put the following sessions together. Everybody enjoy. Well, good afternoon everybody and um, thank you for joining us for uh, this panel which uh, is exploring U.S. central bank digital currency with the Digital Dollar Foundation founders, Christopher Giancarlo and Daniel Gorfine. So thank you both gentlemen for being here today. Really appreciate it and uh, excited about the opportunity to speak with you. To join um, you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to start off because, uh, you know, we have a, a diverse audience with varying levels of understanding of this subject matter. So I think it might be helpful to uh, set a baseline by giving everybody a very brief overview of your impressive backgrounds um, and a high level overview of the Digital Dollar Foundation. And maybe we could start with you, Chris. Um, and, and I think it's obviously important to talk about your uh your most recent uh, government roles as well. Yeah, Thank, thanks, Kevin. It's great to see you. Uh, you know, I spent uh, five years um, uh, from 2014 to 2019 at the U.S. Commodity Futures Trading Commission. And for the second half of that period, uh, I served as its chairman. Uh, for, before that, I spent 30 years in the private sector, almost half of that time uh, practicing law in New York and London. And then starting um, a, a startup company, um, GFI Group, uh, that developed some of the first um, electronic trading platforms for over-the-counter derivatives. And we took that company public in, in 2005 and it had a very successful run. We became wor the world's leading trading platform operating out of 80, uh, 18 uh, major world financial centers operating a network of, of trading for over-the-counter swaps. And that was my background uh, both as an entrepreneur uh, and in financial markets before going to the CFTC. I stepped down, I finished my term after five years uh, last July and uh, re-entered the private sector. And everything that I'm doing in my work in the private sector really is focused on that, that, that junction between markets, uh, between technology and law and public policy. And I'm very focused on areas where so much of our financial infrastructure that was once state of the art has been allowed to age and decay, in some cases become obsolete. And this is a critical issue as we enter this new digital age, an age of the digitization of things of value. And uh, last October, um, I teamed up with Daniel Gorfine, who will introduce himself in a second, and we wrote an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal on why we believe the dollar uh, as one of those core elements of infrastructure need to be modernized for a new digital era. And that led us in January of this year to form the Digital Dollar Foundation, which we'll talk about in a minute. But I'll let Daniel speak about some of his background and why he's involved in this great adventure alongside me. Great. Thanks. Uh, thanks so much, Chris and Kevin. Good to see you, at least virtually. Uh, so those of you who like the movie Memento and like going in kind of reverse chronological order, that's how I'll walk through my background. Um, I actually left the CFTC last summer and uh, launched a boutique fintech advisory and consulting business. Uh, also glad to be here in my capacity as one of the co-founders of the Digital Dollar Project. Um, I also currently serve as adjunct professor at Georgetown University Law School, where I teach fintech law and policy. Um, before that, though, back in 2017, I was fortunate to have uh, joined the CFTC and worked with uh, ch former chairman Chris Giancarlo, uh, to head up Lab CFTC, which was the agency's financial technology and regulatory innovation office uh, that Chairman Giancarlo spearheaded and launched with bipartisan support amongst the other uh, CFTC commissioners. So a fascinating opportunity to help build out a bit of a model or a blueprint for how federal regulators can engage with emerging financial technologies. Uh, before that, I actually served at a uh, fintech company that went public back in 2014, where I was the head of external and regulatory affairs. 
Um, and prior to joining that company, um, I actually had been in think tank world for a while where I focused heavily on access to capital and built out one of the first fintech programs that kind of explored how some of these innovations are impacting existing rules and regulations and policy frameworks. I'm also an attorney by background. I did start my career at a uh, law firm in Washington, D.C., uh, but very much looking forward to joining you for this discussion. And, you know, I'll, I'll say for my, my two cents here in terms of why the Digital Dollar Project and working with Chris in this capacity uh, was, was, seemed so important and of interest to me. And it really, it really ties to the basic idea. We'll come back to this theme time and again. But for many of the viewers today, this won't sound like rocket science, but it's the, it's the understanding that computers are connected to each other by the Internet. And that means that we know we can send information halfway around the world today with very few intermediaries at very low cost and with great efficiency. And I think, uh, you know, what, what Chris and I and his brother and some of our partners at Accenture believe is that things like tokenization and blockchain and DLT stand for the proposition that you can send now information about value and about unique ownership of value the same way halfway around the world with relatively few intermediaries at low cost and with great efficiency. And that dynamic is going, going to impact the way we transact in all types of financial instruments, including money. And so that's what got us uh, thinking last fall, as Chris mentioned, about how this, this dynamic and how these trends are going to impact the U.S. dollar itself. And we thought that was a very important project for us to tackle in a nonprofit kind of thought leadership way. Excellent. Um, and, you know, you have spent a considerable amount of time, both of you, thinking about this. Um, you recently published your white paper, um, and I think this, to further set the stage, it would be great if you could uh, kind of at a high level walk through uh, the white paper, and it's available publicly online uh, for po folks who, who have not read it, um, but to walk through it and also talk a little bit about um, the difference between a central bank digital currency, or in this case, the digital dollar, and a stable coin. Um, like, you know, true USD or tether, because I, I've, I've been on phone calls or conference calls when this issue has come up and it, it was surprising to me uh, that there is a lot of misunderstanding out there about the difference between a stable coin and a, and a, a digital dollar. So if you could kind of uh, talk about the white paper and then and then maybe hit that point too, it would be, it'd be great. Great. So, so maybe what we'll do, Kevin, is maybe I'll take the first part of the question, and then I'll, I'll <coughs> pass the baton to Daniel to address the second part. And the first part is that we, we formed the Digital Dollar Foundation uh, and then teamed up with Accenture uh, to create the Digital Dollar Project in January of, of this year, 2020. And then we sent to work, set to work building a, an advisory board of individuals, of some of the leading um, experts in a range of areas from central banking to commercial banking, from privacy issues to law enforcement and AML KYC issues, uh, to, a, a, as I say, a range of subject matter. And then we sat down with them in, in a series of virtual meetings to come up with what we identify as a champion model for a US central bank digital currency. And when we say a champion model, what that acknowledges is that there's many roads to achieve this, what we wanted to find is where is the middle ground? Where is the most achievable, the most effectuous uh, representation of this? And then put it forward in a thoughtful work, which is our white paper, which released at the end of May, and ask others to come in with challenges to this model and tell us whether indeed it is the right or whether, whether there are elements of this that are better represented in other models. But what we're seeking to do is form public opinion, a consensus around a model for the U.S. to then perceive. You know, when, when uh, in the 1950s, when Russia lost, launched Sputnik, the United States wished to respond. It wasn't right away uh, clear that the response would be landing a person on the moon. That what became the champion model, but after a, a search for consensus. And what we're trying to do here is find that consensus. So we put forward our, our, our champion model in our white paper, which is uh, viewable at digitaldollarproject.org. And we invite your listeners to read it and think about it, because ultimately we, what we want to arrive at is what is the best way forward? What is the best way forward to modernize the dollar for a new digital age, an age in which things of value will become 
digitized, decentralized, and ultimately programmable, how do we have them interact with a, a fiat currency that has those similar properties of digitization and programmability? So what we have proposed in the digital dollar is one, that the dollar be in a tokenized form, not an account space form. Now, there are those who argue that account space might be a way to go. We view it as something of half a loaf. And what, if we're going to modernize the dollar for a new digital age, let's go the full representation of a token. We're open to conversation on that, but that is what is our champion model. We also propose that it should be distributed through the existing bank infrastructure in the same way that fiat money is made available now through from the central bank, through uh, regional banks, through commercial banks, and then distributed to the public, and the banks post reserves against that fiat currency, we're proposing the same distribution mechanism here. Uh, we're also proposing that it is not um, in, in to the exclusion of stable, uh, stable coins and other non-sovereign currencies. And we're also proposing that it doesn't displace existing paper fiat that's in, the, in, in existence in currency. And perhaps here's a good point for me to pause past the baton to Daniel <clears throat> and talk about why we, why, how it's different than say stable coins. Yeah, Perfect. no, thank you, Chris. I think that that's a, a great overview of, of some of the key tenants and, and the perfect segue because again, and that's actually one of the stated explicit tenants of the digital dollar project is that you know, a tokenized US dollar is not antithetical to further private sector innovation, including things like stable coins. If anything, as I'll explain in a second, we think it's additive. I mean, at the end of the day, the system around money, if you view the system around money as a public good and as, as basic infrastructure that you then build upon, I think it helps explain how upgrading that infrastructure can help unleash additional innovation. So how might that happen? So the, the, the first one is around you know, programmability. So when you talk about tokenization, if you tokenize the US dollar, we don't believe that the government is going to be in the business of, of creating significant code and rules within the, the, the token itself. To the extent they do so, it would be minimal. The role of the private sector will be to add kind of wrappers around that or essentially smart contract systems around the tokenized money, which will enable all types of different types of, uh, of business uh, use cases and applications. Um, so, so, you know, you can think about, for example, settlement in financial markets or in capital markets transactions where perhaps you don't want real time settlement. There may be efficiency benefits from having slight delays, but that's code and that's logic that the private se sector may develop around USD in order to help satisfy that particular application. You know, another way to think about this is that I was, I was trying to come up with analogies when you, when you look at the infrastructure arguments and you could think of, about the, the system of money as akin to highways. When the US government decided to build interstate highways, did it have an impact on certain transport businesses? Of course it did. It had, it had an impact because it was a choice to make big, you know, well, at the time, maybe it was only two lane, but to make wider yeah. lane interstate systems. But what did that do? It enabled significant economic activity and new transport businesses to build on top of that. So again, holding that, that, that parallel, you can see how tokenizing the US dollar should enable a lot further innovation in economic activity around payment structures, you know, today we've made a design choice. We have physical cash. That's, that's the choice we've made. We have, as a result of that, an ATM system that's developed. We have different types of payment systems that have developed to fill gaps and build on top of that. The same thing would happen if you upgrade the system to tokenize money, but we think with even better benefit to markets, to individuals and end users. Well, so I would actually like to talk more about some of those benefits. Um, and I think, um, you've already touched on some of those benefits um, and maybe Chris uh, you could talk at a high level um, about some of the the types of things that we might see and I mean one of them obviously that comes to mind I think for most people in the United States is competitiveness of the US dollar on a global um, playing field but if you could talk about some of the kind of an overview of some of the benefits um, and then maybe Daniel you could dig in, or Chris, however you guys want to address it, but could dig into some of the specific use cases or um, types of benefits that we might see from a digital dollar. Maybe some examples of how someone might program a digital dollar um, to do some new and innovative things that we can't currently do with a, with a, with a greenback. 
Sure. So just broad overview, right? Most money that's utilized today is bank money, is, is bank issued money in the form of accounts. And that system, which goes back to the 17th century Amsterdam accounts based system, is a system that requires an enormous amount of message activity, signaling account reconciliation activity before the, the, the actual transfer of money takes place. That system, as, 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 as much work has gone into modernizing it to keep it a pace of human progress, is still a system that is relatively expensive, it's relatively slow, relatively, yeah. and it's relatively exclusionary as we've seen in the COVID crisis when we recognize how much of our society is unbanked. We have the opportunity with new digital technology and the development of distributed ledger technology to move to a token system that will be faster, be less expensive, and could be more permeable to populations that have historically been excluded from accounts-based system. That's the broad overview. Once you then start going down to different use cases, whether they be in retail payments, retail benefits distribution, retail compensation distribution, whether it be in wholesale transactions, merchants in, in business having access or the ability to transfer capital in large amounts, not just small <clears throat> amounts, in large amounts. And then finally to international payments, there's, there's a myriad of uh, of, of improvements from retail across to large institutional um, uh, wholesale. But ultimately, it's about modernizing the infrastructure. If we were going to build a US dollar account system today, would we build it the way it's been built and layered on top for several centuries? Or would we start with this new technology that allows for direct money transfer in the form of tokens? That's what we're calling on. It's the same reason, um, Kevin, why every so often we need to rebuild our airports because they were yeah. built for a former period of time and don't serve as well in a new period of time. It's a reason why we rebuild our transportation system. It's about core architecture. And we know that when we upgrade architecture, businesses build on top of that and commerce uh, thrives and wealth is created and economic growth takes place and jobs are created. This is about infrastructure. It's about national infrastructure, about modernizing it for a new age and a new time. Yeah, I think that's really well put. So I'm not going to spend too much time, um, you know, layering on top of that. But I think that one of the one thing I would add is that through the digital dollar project, we're, we're really large proponents of pilots and real world trials so that we can test the, the benefits of tokenization in these different types of kind of bucketed use cases or applications. So Chris outlined, you know, there's retail payments, there's wholesale, there's international applications. I might drill down for a second on the retail front of what's interesting. Y you know, one thing that we think this would do is it creates an alternative set of payment rails for small business owners, for merchants who may be able to now accept digital cash alongside other types of payment systems. Competition typically benefits the consumer and the end user, could drive down certain costs and, um, and friction points that exist within the current payment system. Uh, the other area that's really interesting is around access and inclusion, and, and Chris started getting into this idea, but th that's basically driven our hypothesis is that the lower cost of operating a token-based system, as well as the idea that digital wallet service providers you know, may be able, and again, may, we, this is why we need to test and actually see this in the real world, but may be able to offer digital wallet services at lower costs from a technology and operations and a regulatory perspective than a traditional bank account. And if that's true, if you can offer kind of this very focused type of a service at quite low cost, then you could imagine it becoming ubiquitous on smartphones. I mean, some of the data yeah. is quite interesting. Uh, I think Pew, uh, found that 60% of the un or underbanked population has a smartphone. So you can imagine a digital wallet service coming preloaded with, uh, I'm sorry, a, a smartphone coming preloaded with digital wallet services, which could allow for onboarding un and underbanked populations um, and to have access to digital cash. Currently, physical cash is the choice payment system for many, yeah. but that doesn't e enable you to actually participate in a digital economy. So that's an area as well that we think is quite interesting to take a look at. Yeah, I mean, as, as I was reading through your 
paper, um, and I think you had a reference to it, um, you know, in, in one of the COVID relief bills, there was a, 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 a one that didn't pass, but, it, you know, a provision to, to, that, that would, would um, tell, tell the guard, it's a slightly, slightly different, different idea, idea but, but, you know, yeah. Let's have a digital payment for COVID relief so that, you know, I could see a benefit. You could program that dollar for um, supplemental nutrition assistance or COVID relief assistance or things like that. It seems like there's a lot of benefits um, to having a dollar that can move electronically. Um, so a digital dollar is a real dollar. It's not like a stable coin, a representation, a, back, a token backed by a dollar somewhere else. It is a dollar, just like a piece of paper money. Um, and I, when I'm thinking about, so, you know, there's lots of potential benefits, you know, as with everything, there's also potential concerns or drawbacks. I can't think of anything that's more private than a transaction with a, a paper dollar bill. I can hand it to you and you and I are the only two people that know about the transaction unless we, we broadcast that or, or, or do it publicly, something like that. Um, so with a digital dollar, uh, presumably there is a digital record of its movement and that has benefits, uh, but also certainly some privacy concerns. So could you talk about some of the potential concerns that a digital dollar would raise and sort of you know, how you are, are, are going, you know, uh, approaching that issue and, 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 and trying to navigate that? And I'm thinking like Fourth Amendment privacy concerns and that kind of thing. Sure. So you're absolutely right, Kevin, that the big distinction between a central bank digital currency and say a stable coin is that a central bank digital currency is an obligation of the central bank as opposed to an obligation on a commercial institution of some sort that may itself have a vault of gold or a vault of dollars but ultimately yeah. that's a claim on a commercial institution right. as opposed to a claim on a central bank which is what we're proposing we're also proposing that uh, what we call the digital dollar, which is a U.S. central bank digital currency, be informed by distributed ledger technology in its, in its, in its distribution, in its architecture. And therefore, the, um, the record, the mutable record, would be present. The question is how much anonymity or transparency to program into that development. And that's the key word there is programming. Privacy in a digital environment becomes a design choice. And policymakers get to make that policy yeah. choice no, uh, conscious of Fourth Amendment principles of a right to privacy, conscious though of national security and, and, and uh, anti-money laundering, anti-human trafficking, and, you know, law enforcement issues, and how to balance the two. You know, it's a misconception that in paper cash money, there's full anonymity. <clears throat> That's a misconception because there is full anonymity below a certain level. A design choice was made years ago that above $10,000, there would not be anonymity in the use of dollars in, 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 com in certain commercial transactions. Right. Again, design choice. So we policymakers will get to make a design choice in developing a digital dollar. And I think that's to Daniel's point, why it's so essential that we have a series of pilot programs to find what the right level is there. Now, I'm one who believes that if the United States, if the United States gets this design choice right in a way that's consistent with our historical principles of the right to privacy from state surveillance, a digital dollar could actually be the prefer the world's preference currency compared to say, digital currency developed by non-democracies, um, uh, states that don't recognize uh, the rights of their citizens to privacy, or against other states that may be more focused on restricting commercial exploitation of, of, of transaction information, but be fully open to state surveillance. If we get it right in the United States, and I believe we must, and I think we should, and I think it becomes a competitive issue to get it right, we could develop a digital dollar with the right level of privacy and yet the right balance of, of, of appropriate law enforcement restrictions. But again, it's, it's about programming it in. And, and, the, and to, to finish on this point, the, the best argument, I think, for going to a digital currency is the ability to program in particular values that are important to a modern democratic society, program them in right th from the beginning, both technologically and embedded in our law and jurisprudence as well. 
Yeah, that's a, a, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a great, great point. point. As, As I read, read the paper, paper, I just kept, kept thinking about, well, privacy uh, erosion is sort of a one-way street. street. You know, As you, you lose privacy in our society, society and we're talking about through marketing and advertising, and, you know, our information is out there, it's kind of hard to put that back in the bottle. And and, and I, I think, think what you're saying, saying as I understand it, uh, the, the nice thing about it is as long as we get to decide, you can set the dollar wherever you think is appropriate or the, the, the policymakers think is appropriate. Actually, you know, if you look at history, uh, rights to privacy don't always uh, diminish over time. In fact, it's more often than not, you know, in say in, in Britain, for example, there was no right, right to privacy until a modern middle class emerged and they demanded those rights from their sovereign, just as yeah. our founders of our country demanded those rights from informing our government. So I don't believe there's a historical direction toward less privacy. It's important for us as right. we design our digital dollar, decide what those rights of privacy should be and make sure they're embodied in this new innovation for the future. And we shouldn't assume, and, and, right. and, and certainly I don't think we at the digital dollar project assume uh, a lack of privacy in a digital dollar. We, we, we're, we're here to work to make sure that the right yeah. balance is built into it and work with policymakers to get this very important element right. And besides, getting this important element right is a competitive advantage for the United States if we get Absolutely. it right. And that's all the more reason to get the balance right. I think that's right. I absolutely think that's right. And something we, we as a democracy have been good at in the past. And um, I, I think we have to figure that appropriate balance. And, and, and talking about balance, um, you know, another another area of sort of the yin and yang of this is, is the sort of um, complete open source versus walled garden approach to, you know, some digital currencies, they, they are, they operate within um, their own sort of walled garden and they're not, there's not a lot of interoperability. They don't play well with others. And so they're great so long as you're in that silo. Um, and on the one hand, I could see a desire to have a digital dollar be kind of closed um, to prevent, you know, whether it's state sponsored actors or hackers or the others from, you know, uh, compromising our systems. On the other hand, uh, the, the more open the architecture uh, the more innovation you're going to have and probably the more businesses and, and other um, jurisdictions that will adopt it. So how do you approach that sort of walled garden versus, you know, complete open source with the risks and benefits that go to go with those? So, so maybe I'll, I'll start there and, and, and say, look, the point on interoperability is critical. I mean, so, so if you start off with the, with the premise that the United States dollar is the choice reserve currency of the world, we certainly don't want to walk back from that. So you would want to develop a system that is interoperable with other major central bank initiatives as well. That's why one of the things that we've focused on doing through the Digital Dollar Project is to engage uh, closely with other central banks that are that are pursuing their various pilots and trials uh, associated with CBDC. Um, at the end of the day, that's going to be really important. And there are certain groups like the IMF and, and World Bank, and you have BIS that are focused as well on interoperability. So we certainly don't want to create a system that walks back and creates an even more siloed type structure. Um, that would completely defeat the purpose of what we were talking about at the outset, which is the internet allows connectivity of computers yeah. with relatively limited friction and relatively few intermediaries. So we shouldn't be adding those layers back in. Um, you know, and actually to, to make the point too, that if we view this and if we view tokenization of the U.S. dollar as an offensive uh, opportunity rather than something defensive in nature, there's a lot of opportunity even further dollarization. Now, that's something that has its own set of challenges. I mean, there may be certain global uh, emerging markets that would struggle with free access to tokenized USD. Um, but certainly there would be a lot of advantages for end users and for consumers on the ground. So, so it is really important that as we design our systems, we think about openness, we think about interoperability. Um, in my view, that uh, just unlocks the benefits of tokenization and all of these trends and, and dynamics that uh, Chris and I are talking about. So, um, Chris, I don't know if you have further thoughts on that topic. No, I think interoperability is critically important. It's one of the reasons why the Digital Dollar Project and its, uh, and its team and its advisory group have spent a fair amount of time talking with uh, our, our colleagues in the UK, uh, at, at the BIS in Switzerland, um, uh, and, and uh, uh, our friends at the Rix Bank, with, with others that are working on uh, developing central bank digital currency. It's one of the reasons why it's so important that the United States gets started now 
it's because these other efforts are underway and they're making good progress. If the United States suddenly wakes up three years, five years from now and says, oh, we now need to get in the game, yeah. a lot of the protocols are going to be developed. Now is the time for the United States to be in the game working with others so that when, and I believe it's not a question of if, it's certainly a question of when, the world's major economies all move to a digital uh, currency system they're all interoperable with one another, that the core foundational architecture was set at this point in time. We think the United States needs to get in those games, and it is, it needs to go further, however. And we at the Digital Dollar Project are certainly encouraging a ongoing dialogue with efforts underway elsewhere. Um, we're, we're, we're running a little short on time. I, there's a, a lot of topics I'd like to hit, um, but I'll, I'll try to, uh, um, whittle it down here. Um, I'd like to talk about the impact on the existing sort of uh, market structure, banks and the like, um, and then maybe kind of some concluding thoughts on where you know sort of procedurally and 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 sub substantively what the next steps are. Um, but on the bank point, uh, you said something interesting, Daniel. You talked about you know we built the highways. Uh, update our infrastructure, and yeah, it had some impact on existing transportation businesses, but then there was just so much more that came out of that. <clears throat> I think of the banks as the existing transportation systems and the digital dollar. Um, and in your paper, you guys wrote, and I'm going to just very quickly read from it, unless the digital dollar is put into a safe deposit like storage or custodial solution, once exchanged for balances in a bank account, it's fungible with other monies as it is on a bank's balance sheet. This is important for several reasons, but one of the most vital is to ensure that consumers and businesses keep deposits at commercial banks. These, these deposits underpin the U.S. economy by enabling banks to lend funds to borrowers for activities such as buying a home, building a new factory, and everything in between. Um, so point, point well taken. We need, we, you know, banks serve an important function in moving money through the system, giving people access to credit and loans and things like that. Um, and I'm sure you've seen, and it's really in the last six months, even though it's been going on for a while, this explosion in the, the DeFi world where, you know, you can, you can borrow and lend digital assets and, and, and earn a rate of interest on a digital asset. Um, and what I like about a digital dollar is that, um, if I want to control my money, I can I can store it. Now it may not be appealing to me to store a big you know suitcase of, of dollar bills, but um, I can I can potentially store my digital dollars as safely and easily as I can uh, myself as I can with a bank. Um, so if this comes to pass, I mean, what is the impact on on banks? And do I even need a bank because maybe I can store it myself, move it myself? I don't need to use a wire uh, ACH. And um, maybe I can even earn interest through a third party, you know, DeFi type uh, so, systems. Yeah. So, so talk about Ke that. <laughs> Kevin, it's, it, it's, it's a great question. And I'm going to say, at least from a retail perspective, I think that the quick answer to this is that the analog with physical cash holds. So the reality is most people don't want to hold inordinate amounts of physical cash because you would yeah. lack FDIC insurance coverage. Um, it's not interest bearing if you bury it under your mattress or put it in a safe deposit box. The same, at least in our champion model, would be true of digital tokenized cash. You have a choice as a consumer to hold that in a custodial wallet, if you will, um, but understand that that likely will not come with FDIC insurance and will likely not be interest bearing. Right. Most people would choose to hold the, the, the proper balance or an equilibrium balance of tokenized cash and that type of a custodial wallet. But if you want to secure yourself FDIC insurance or the benefits of interest payments, you would be incentivized to move your money into a, com a traditional commercial bank account and you would be able to do so readily. Um, that's actually one of the advantages of our champion model is it would avoid mass disruption to commercial bank deposits. And one thing that I know Chris outlined at the outset, but to really underscore the point, this is also why we're not you know, believers that at least the underpinning of this system should be where the central bank is offering direct retail accounts to consumers or, or, or individuals. That could displace the commercial banking system in, per, in perhaps a very disruptive way because of what you mentioned. Lending activity uh, typically yeah. originates in our commercial banks. So 
the, the quick answer to that is, is at a retail level, consumers would have choice as to how they would want to custody uh, digital cash, but it would be interoperable and exchangeable within the commercial banking system, which maintains that economic function. A few minutes ago, Kevin, I mentioned that, you know, looking at it broadly, the current accounts-based system is slow, it's expensive, and it's exclusionary. Some of the actors who are, who are most directly looking at uh, central bank digital currency and stable coins as a solution to that are the very banks who may become disintermediated to some degree by this innovation. And they recognize that and they're experimenting with this new technology now. The technology, you know, technology is, is, is it's like a driving wind. You know, you, you can try to stand up against it, but it'll knock you down. Much better to harness it the way you do a sail or, 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 or a plane to do things with it. And that's what we're talking about. This technology is coming. There will be new opportunities for forward-leaning financial institutions. And in, some of them will be the old-fashioned ones of, 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 of collecting deposits and, and paying interest on them lending for a new home, lending for a new car, all the activities that banks do. But others may be things you might not even think of. I mean, right now, banks operate AML KYC functions as a back office loss leading function, where there may be an opportunity to move that into a front office on a white label basis for wallet providers who are gonna need that function. There's also gonna have to be those who can write, if, if, if the road is a distributed ledger, approach that those who can write to it are going to need to be included in a financial regulatory structure as well. There's going to be new innovations that are going to come out of this, just as new innovations came out of the internet, just as new inter innovations came out of the space program, new innovations will come out. And for those, those banks that are forward looking, who are already experimenting with it now, see there's going to be new opportunities and are going to go with that and, and develop the money of the future. Excellent. Excellent. Um, we are almost out of time. Uh, I, I, I wanted to just uh, kind of to close out, you know, I, I, we I'm, at Delta Strategy Group we work with a lot of financial market participants and digital asset blockchain companies. And I know there's a lot of, of people in that those circles who are talking about your white paper, you know, all of our clients are, are talking about it, they're potentially formulating, uh, you know, um, comments or things like that as th that you've called for. But what, well, you know, what are the next steps procedurally and substantively to get to, you know, to get to, you know, uh, a decision on whether it's the challenger model or, um, uh, or, or there's, you know, some other path and, and sort of how do we get there? So where, where are we now and where are we going? I guess that's well, maybe, what I'd like to close maybe it out. Maybe we'll do this as a two-parter and I'll do the first part and Daniel would do the second. I think yeah. the two part, the first part of that is where are we now? Well, I'm proud to say We've come a long way since Daniel's in my op-ed in the Wall Street Journal last October, right. when we we're hoping to build a consensus around the need to explore a U.S. CBDC. And in that period of time, even Chairman Powell, just in the last few weeks, said that the United States needs to be in the first rank in developing that. this. Uh, 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 Governor uh, Lyle Brannard uh, has said something similar. And at the international level, you see people like Augustin Karstens and others at the BIS also saying that the, the consensus is building that this needs to be done. And the global consensus of our allies is the United States needs to be in that game. And that's that idea is getting around. So I think we, the idea has come a long way in a short period of time. Uh, what's next, however, is to now take a building consensus that the United States needs to play a leadership role to bring that back, back down to actual, how do we get there? How do we take leadership? And that's, Daniel might want to speak to that. Yeah, look, I'll, I'll end kind of with well, one of the pieces we started with is the importance at, at this stage of real world pilots and trials. I mean, there's been a lot of, I think that there's been the right amount of talk and thinking going into, you know, what are the champion models? What are the purported benefits? What are some of the risks? And a lot of great thinking and publications have come out as a result of that. But now it's time to see where the rubber hits the road. So we're certainly proponents in starting to test in the retail context, in the wholesale, in the international context. Uh, let's, let's start to see what tokenization uh, provides by way of benefits. There are going to be some other you know, meaty topics like around privacy, around the rails, which we had a, a chance to start going into here. But, you know, how does blockchain or DLT 
uh, help inspire or build the rails that we're going to need to actually move a tokenized dollar. So we need to now get kind of beyond the rhetoric, and it's going to be really important to see uh, trials, hopefully sponsored at the public level, uh, but certainly the private sector will be partners in that, uh, and the private sector can help to drive some of it too to actually start de developing empirical evidence and information about what tokenization can provide. And Kevin, I'll end with one note, and that is that um, there are some that might think that this is such an important project that it needs to be done exclusively by the official sector. I would counter that and say this is such an important project. It absolutely needs to be driven by the official sector, but with enormous amount of input from the private sector. That's how the United States was able to land on the moon. That's how the United States was able to build the internet. When the United States does big things, they're a combination of private sector expertise, innovativeness, and sense of urgency, and public sector concerns for the public interest and in setting down the right policies. And that's what we've got to bring to bear here. If we're going to build what is vitally important, I believe, for the, United, for the future of the dollar and the future of money, is that the values of democratic values, of free enterprise, of the rule of law, and the right balance of privacy be brought to bear in the future of the U.S. dollar. Excellent. Excellent. Well, thank you both so much. I really appreciate your time and I know uh, our audience does too. So we'll wrap up and uh, good luck to you uh, both and I look forward to learning more about the Digital Dollar Project. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin.